welcome to the Final Notes interviews. My guest today is an award-winning composer with an extensive background in writing music for film, television, and video games. Some of his best-known works include music for Shadow of Mordor, Dante's Inferno, and of course, the Bioshock trilogy, Gary Scheinman. So how are you this afternoon? I'm good. I'm good, actually. It's morning here in Los Angeles, and uh, it's a over rainy uh, Monday, but that's a good thing because we've had a few years of drought, so we're <laughs> happy to have all this water come down. That's surprising, right? Um, yeah. So I like to start out these interviews with the most basic of questions, but I'm always interested to ask this. Um, when and how did you first discover an interest in music? And how did that eventually shape into a career? Well, it, it was it was very uh, it was very spontaneous. I was 14 years old, and my brother was taking piano lessons. So my mom rented a piano, Baldwin Acrosonic. If anybody knows <laughs> what that was, but um, my brothers had a fleeting interest in it. But I just was mesmerized by the instrument and wanted to learn to play. And um, played for hours, and then took lessons, mostly classical lessons. Just loved music and particularly classical music. So um, that was how my interest started at, at that age, which is relatively late, I suppose, for a player, not for a composer, however. So how did that eventually form into a career? When did, when did that moment happen, spark into your brain, when you felt you could make a, a living out of this? Well, before I, I graduated from USC, but before I went to USC, I went to Sonoma State mm -hmm. uh, University, which is in Northern California. And I, I did not go on as a music major. I just I actually was a, a biology major, which I had no particular interest in biology. Just at the time, that was what I understood, an easy way to become get accepted. Yeah. So, um, but what I found as soon as I went to USC was all I wanted to take was music classes. And they actually had a fantastic music department with, with a couple of really wonderful professors there. So I, I went there for two years and sort of, you know, did all the basic music classes, mm -hmm. uh, studied um, ear training and piano and uh, even, even some composition and music history, all, all, all of the basics of, uh, of music. And then decided that I wanted to study music full time. And I decided I wanted to be a composer, but I decided specifically that I wanted to be a film and television composer. I did not want to teach. I wanted to, to be a full-time composer for film and TV. And so when I explored, USC seemed to be to have really vast composition department in Southern California. And so I came back to, to LA and studied there actually for three years and got a composition degree at USC and immediately got out and started looking for work as a film and television composer. Cool. So I do want to talk about that stuff, about uh, composing for multimedia, film, video games. But first, I kind of want to talk about your original project that you premiered only a few months ago, the Three Movement Concerto for the Viola, the Zingaro. What was your What was your inspiration behind that piece? Well, it, it was a, believe it or not, it was a dream. Mm -hmm. I was in Spain, traveling in Spain, and I had it. I was in Madrid, and I had a, I had a dream that I was at a um, central square in Madrid, and that a, actually a guitarist in my dream, like a gypsy guitarist, mm. improvising a concerto with an orchestra backing it. It was a pretty interesting feat, if it was possible. And, that, and, I, and I woke up, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. Really, a month or two after I returned to LA, I decided to write a movement, and, and decided not to write a guitar concerto. I think because I was a little intimidated by classical guitar. Mm -hmm. Classical guitar is its own unique instrument, and in, in, you know, every every instrument is unique. But mm -hmm. understanding the technique and how to really write a concerto for a classical guitar is a challenge that I didn't feel competent to do. But I did feel competent to write a concerto for. Initially, it was a violin, then I decided on a viola. And because as I started writing the violin part, I realized that really what I wanted was almost like a double concerto. It was going to be like for violin and cello. And then I decided, well, if I just change a few things, I can do this for viola, because that's in between, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes down to the C below middle C. So that was it. I wrote the first movement, and I really liked it. And then I said, well, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a slow movement. And then I wrote the slow movement, which I thought was 
which I, I would like. And I thought, well, you know, I, I have a three movement concerto if I just write one more <laughs> movement here, you know, which, so I was kind of like got sucked into it and then I ended up with the, with the concerto that, that did get performed last summer at the Anson Ford Theater, which is like an open air uh, amphitheater in Los Angeles. And it, it's, it was wonderful. It was really a treat to hear it uh, performed. Yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed the piece. I've listened to it twice now. My my only question is, um, I don't, I'm not as familiar. Do, do you compose a, on a regular basis for like for projects no. like that for Zingaro? No, 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 no. <laughs> I was at Lark because I'm busy. I mean, I, I kept busy writing for a lot of games the last decade mm -hmm. and, and films, and I just I, I'd have to just find something that just really excited me and motivated me, and I, I would consider, certainly consider writing more music. I've written chamber music prior to this, certainly, you know, yeah. and I think some of my music for, for film and games sort of falls almost in the classical kind of vibe, but no, I'm not writing a lot of, I haven't written a lot of concert music. It was it was a lark, shall we say. Well, it, was a, it was a good lark. <laughs> I liked Thank it you. a lot. Thank you. So going to... Some of the scores you're most famous for are for the Bioshock tri trilogy, but from what I know, from what I gather, your first foray into video game scoring was for the video game Voyeur. Yes. And that was with a that was with an actual orchestra, wasn't it? It was. It was. Um, it was 1993, and the reason it, in in the 80s and early 90s, orchestral scores were pretty almost non-existent because. Yeah of the nature of video games um, and the inability to record music and have large, what would then be large files incorporated into the games because they're pretty simple technologically and the music was usually MIDI, which is, you know, real, takes up almost no space on a, yeah. in, in a computer code and triggering sort of an in-game little tiny synth engine with a few sounds, three or four sounds available to it. And they, and the composers who did those, who scored those games did an amazingly clever uh, job, but they weren't capable of producing orchestral scores. So along came this technology called Philip, uh, by Philips Interactive, uh, which is Philips' big um, Dutch uh, electronics company. And they had this CDI technology, CD standing for compact disc, and, and the CD was fairly new technology in the early 90s. But because you could put whopping 700 plus megabytes of data on a CD, which was enormous back then, uh, you had room for compressed recorded audio files. So the, this, this technology, which, which did not fare so well in the marketplace, uh, was basically like a video tree. Um, you would you'd watch some scenes and they were shot video and then you'd make decisions as a player okay i like voyeur was like a, a rear window you know the hitchcock movie mm -hmm. where you think you're seeing a murder out your window at the house next door but you can't so you have to gather clues and etc as you gather the clues you decide whether you want to interfere or call the police if you do it too often too soon i i to be honest with you, i don't remember all the details of how you played that game but I scored it like I would score a TV show or a film. It was just scenes that needed score, and they had the budget for an orchestra. So I did record the score in L.A. with a live orchestra, and it was it was fun. So didn't think too much about it, but I do believe if it's as I say, it's, if it wasn't the first, it was one of the very first video game scores with an orchestra. Yeah, I, I would think it would have to be the first because the most. Com common score I hear being labeled as the as the first orchestral score was for a game called Heart of Darkness, which was definitely a it's a really cool score. But that was that came out in 1996, I believe. So I I, I would imagine Voyeur might be the uh, original first video game score to get an orchestra. But I guess maybe the only reason people don't point Voyeur out is because it's a bit more obscure and because of the title. <laughs> I guess uh, I don't know, but. It certainly, I think it probably was, but as I've had people disagree with me, and I don't want to say <laughs> say that it was, because I'm not. I, I'm not. It's kind of a nerdy uh, title to be. <laughs> I'm not sure that I that I really need 
need that title. Uh, and uh, and so I don't want to say definitively is because I don't know. I, 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 there may have been some video game that had an orchestra score uh, prior to that, but I kind of think it may be the first. So it's kind of a, a cool, nerdy title if in fact I deserve it. <laughs> Talking about video game music when it was just in MIDI format or some kind of electronic synth, and I'm I'm always kind of I'm always a bit half and half on that. Some 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 of the music was really good, but you just for, for at least or at least for me, I could never really gel into it because the 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 quality of the of the programming of, of the music of the of the overall sound was just kind of uh. on the other side of it. You had 16-bit music, very retro uh, music as it's called now, but it had very interesting, neat sounds a lot of the time and uh, interesting melodies and would go uh, places you maybe wouldn't expect for video game music. I think that's kind of looking back on it and looking at all video game uh, pieces that are getting now rearranged for an orchestra. Now that's kind of the charm to them. Is I, I even read an interview uh, where you quoted Stravinsky as saying pretty much paraphrasing that restriction is almost a blessing sometimes when you're limited by technology as far as video game music goes you kind of have a sort of different creative leeway that might be different from other kinds of film composing or composing for television so i guess i i guess what i'm pretty much asking you is what your thoughts might be on the evolution of video game music over the over the many years and how that's how that's kind of been a blessing in disguise, that restriction. How that's kind of been a blessing in, the, in disguise, that restriction. Well, you know, I mean, the, the composers who were working early on in video games, uh, they had to work within an enormous restriction in terms of uh, son, sonic uh, hmm. capabilities of, uh, that they were provided with. Um, and I'm not sure, I think a lot of them may not have been you know, trained composers. They may have been yeah. musical, but not trained composers. So, you know, they, they did the best. I'm sure, it, like, you know, there, there's always been terrible film scores and, and great film scores. And mm. there's a lot of, there, there's, a, there's always good and bad. So some of those old game scores are quite forgettable, <laughs> but some of them just are classics. And I think mm. that they're classics in terms of just the, the melodic material was so so much fun and so memorable and uh, you know and the way it was achieved was was just really really cool so uh, there's a few key games mario brothers etc that sort of re retain their charm all these years later you know um, yeah. because they were such pioneering games and because this the melodies were so earworms as they say you know and, and you play those games over and over again. And so were, the, were they, it weren't Beethoven, but how much music is Beethoven, you know, really great music. So, yeah, but, but then when the, the hardware improved dramatically in the late 90s, and you had uh, PlayStation and, and Xbox, um, and as the games started earning more money, that permitted uh, them to hire contracting composers. They didn't have to work just with in-house composers who would also do the audio. Um, so as there was money to record with orchestras, the quality of the music just increased dramatically in the early 2000s. And that's when I entered the field. It was in 2004 when I did Destroy Humans. And uh, I was not a gamer at that time, but it was like such a, you know, I remember seeing it and wow, this is really interesting. This is so cool. This new medium. Uh, I wasn't sure if it was going to last or where it was going to go, or, you know, but it was just so new to me at the time. And then um, as I got into it, I realized that it had, there's a lot of wonderful things about writing music for games. And I've said this before, and it's, it's always worth saying is that the most interesting music I've ever been asked to write has been games. So the medium seems to have evolved and permitted experiments, experimentation in writing. I mean, not to say that film and TV don't permit that. Yeah. But um, it, it, film and TV these days are pretty ambient in tone, not all, but a lot of it. And so it seems like games seem to be able to permit stronger, more musical content, stronger musical content, shall we say. Maybe that's, maybe I'm 
oversimplifying. So, um, yeah, the video game music has evolved enormously. And of course, the difference is that some music in video games is just is similar to film and TV music. You're scoring in game movies or you're, you're writing a theme. But, but then there's the interactive music, which is a big challenge and a big part of what we do. And it's just as simple as writing a loop or layered music or music that vertically veers from one cue to the next based upon player action. So you're trying, obviously, to, to create music that's both working in the, in the game, but also is changing with every player's unique playing experience. So that's, that's the challenge for game music. And that keeps evolving and getting more complex. Certainly. On that on that topic, um, it's almost been a decade, I think, since the first Bioshock game came out. And I can't exactly remember the uh, reaction of critics of the game music world, but I would have to imagine at that time there was definitely some surprise and shock <laughs> at the Bioshock score. I certainly remember that when I played it uh, all those years ago, I think it, I played it when it came out, um, that that was one of the first things that grabbed me was the ocean on his shoulders and uh, the other piece, which I'm forgetting the name to. But, well, Rapture, maybe. Yeah, Rapture. Um, welcome to Rapture. Uh, my question is first to ask just how that score came to be, how you got involved with the Bioshock score? Well, um, the first, the game I did in 2004 was Destroy Humans. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, the woman who was the audio director, who really was mostly responsible for choosing me as the composer for that, even though I had no very little gaming experience, mm -hmm. was Emily Ridgeway. And uh, we had a terrific um, time working on Destroy All Humans. She really loved that score. I really enjoyed working on the score. I enjoyed working with her. She was really smart in terms of and creative. She had a music degree herself. And um, she went on to get hired by uh, Irrational Games after leaving Pandemic, which made Destroy All Humans. Mm. And when she did that, she they were making Bioshock. I did a game or two in between that, and then she really said uh, she really fought for me to score Bioshock. And they, and, you know, at, at the time, they, they didn't know that it was going to be a huge, you know, iconic game. It was just another game, and so they they gave her her preference, which was great, even though she was you know new there and they didn't know me. So I was I'm really, really grateful that they were open to that. And then under her direction and and the fact that Ken Levine creative director um, had said to me, says, look, you know, we're making this game. We're going to either have the biggest failure or, or a very huge hit because we're not going to compromise. This is all about making something really fantastic. And I, I was, I was very uh, pleased to hear that. He really was, it was all about you know, being creative and doing something amazing, you know? And yeah. Emily had said, look, we were to sound, to sound unlike any other game, or film or television score it should be completely unique sounding, which is a challenge and a thing that's a little overwhelming sometimes to hear. Uh, and sometimes they even mean it, and in this case, they meant it because I've heard that before, but they don't mean it. So in this instance, they really wanted something unique, and, and they and Emily, because I had this working relationship with Emily, she gave me a lot of space to experiment and try things, and. Uh, and I had and I, over a couple of months, I was trying things. She just said, no, that's not quite it. That's cool, but that's not quite it. And then one day I started to come up with some ideas and adding solo violins and some good samples for them and Chelly. And she says, that's it. That's the Bioshock sound. And uh, that, I was off to the race and said, I, I, I was excited about that. And she was. And, uh, and they didn't, uh, even the music was pretty unusual for a game for that time. They didn't, uh, they didn't wince. They were like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> this is cool. We love, we love this. And so, yeah, and it was very exciting when the game came out. The music, uh, the games, of course, extraordinarily well received. <laughs> and, um, and the music was, uh, was really, 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 especially the music community, the gaming music community really loved it. And I was, I was on people's 
was less than that, you yeah. know, for, for working on projects. So that was, uh, that was wonderful. Totally. So what was your mindset for a project like that? Were you concerned with sort of the ambience of the environment or the emotional underplay, the stakes of the story? What was really driving you in that creative process, do you feel? Well, the things that struck me about the game, I mean, because whenever I write a score, it's it's not about what I want to write, it's about what's good for the project. Right. That's highest, that's totally, you know, when I wrote my viola concerto, it was what I wanted to write. Yeah. And no one, no one was telling me, uh, giving me any input on that. But when I was writing this, writing any score, it's all about what's good for this. So I, I saw a lot of things going on. There was this intellectual underpinning with this uh, Andrew Ryan character, which is perhaps a using the acronym of Ayn Rand, and the this city under the sea with the best of utopian hopes mm. becoming quickly dystopian and tragic, uh, and and it seemed to me that that's that what was interesting about that is that that's happened so many times before where the, the utopian dream like you know Soviet Union yeah. uh, or uh, Germany Nazi Germany for that matter ended up in nightmares nightmare countries you know <laughs> so it seemed like that was interesting and tragic it's a tragic element to some of the cues there's also there's also the intellectual element because I think that it is a it, the city uh, as Andrew Ryan created it was uh, was an intellectual paradise. And so I used sort of early, mid 20th century classical music as a guide. And then there was just all this scary crap coming at you. <laughs> you know, there's splicers abound and there's, you're, you just never know what's going to come at you. <clears throat> it's a really frightening world where, you know, a lot of people have been murdered and, and it's just a killing field. And there's a lot of crazy people everywhere. So there's a sort of insane element, mm. which I use some sort of mid 20th century technique called aleatory, which is very creepy <laughs> orchestral writing. And and then I used a technique called musique concrète, which is a fancy French word for a, a style of, um, of writing that was popular in post-World War II France, that's the French moniker, uh, in which they, they would use, they would make sound montages of actual world, sounds of the world, and, they, and that was their, the music, you know, you, they take sound of a train and breaking glass and mm. whatever, and they make these sound montages. And that, so I and I added all those elements together in some of the cues, and it created a pretty unique um, vibe to it. None of the uh, elements on themselves were unique, but all of them, the way they were combined, I think, was pretty pretty unusual and it created something. I think that really fit the game, and it's certainly everything in retrospect. Uh, success always seems to be ideal, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> if it had crashed and burned, we'd all be looking back at what a terrible choice they had made in hiring me, I suppose. No, I mean, it's a really cool combination. I mean, it's it's one thing to feel unease when scary music is playing, but to kind of compare that to more somber, uh, classical-styled music at the same time puts you even more on ease. I mean, that's interesting with uh, the mention of, how do you pronounce that, Aeolian mode? I never know how to pronounce it. Aleatoric, aleatoric, uh, aleatoric style. Aleatoric, which is a, I think, a Latin word for dice, which uh, meaning that uh, there's an element of chance thrown into uh, the the way the players are asked to improvise and creates sort of a chaotic um, atmospheres. Hmm. I mean, that's interesting. I just, I kind of, a part of that word, I just kind of remember uh, the Leonard Bernstein lesson and. Him talking about no one likes to use the alien alien I can't pronounce it. Aleatoric. Aleatoric. <laughs> and that yes. no one that no one likes to do the aleatoric because it's very it's very unhinged and uh, so it's so it's not often used. But in this case, it went great <laughs> with five. Yeah, I think it's used more than you think. You know, uh, a lot of uh, yeah. John Williams scores include aleatoric passages. Yeah. It, 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 but it doesn't have to be the entire score doesn't have to be aleatoric. You can just have moments of aleatory, which create this really dark rush of sound. It's, it's interesting how much of it 
has uh, been used in uh, music, you know, really good film scores like Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams. But um, it was it was pretty new for games. I don't think anyone had ever used that technique in a game. Yeah. So it it, it kind of it was, it, but it just worked. It was it, I didn't use it to, to say I was the first to use mm-hmm. aleatorium. Uh, techniques. I would not have used it if it was inappropriate. I would, there's just no way. It was all about. I thought it was really worked well for the game. Okay, it certainly did. I and I, I know uh, uh, composers. You know, they have a lot of projects, and so I, I was kind of apprehensive to to just ask real quick what your thoughts on the uh, score to Bioshock Two were, and just maybe the challenges in coming back to that world again and creating even more music for a rapture that was now in an even worse state somehow. Well, I enjoyed working on Bioshock 2. Mm. It did not get, it didn't get nearly the kudos that the original did, but I thought it was a very well-made game. I really enjoyed scoring it, and I think some of my music, which was essentially the same style, was maybe I kind of refined what I did in original Bioshock in, in some good ways. Hmm. So it was really it was really a, a great pleasure. I, I think the score turned out well and I think you know, they were very happy with it. I think it, it, it worked well with the game. Um, but it, it, the game never achieved the kind of success of the original one and then Infinite was a complete change in the Bioshock series. So the score was quite different. Sounds of the Lighthouse House available on Amazon for those listening. <laughs> Is it is that for sale on Amazon that they never released a score? I thought I thought I thought yeah I thought it was. <laughs> Maybe it is. I mean, uh, my understanding was they there was you could buy it like used because it hmm. came with when you bought the premium game you got CD and then you also got an LP of the original score which hmm. was pretty cool. It all came with the um, extra what do they call it the premium version of the game. My understanding was it never got released. Like if you go to iTunes you can't find any Bioshock music for sale. Well, yeah, well it is there. Last time I checked, so it, it should still be okay. <laughs> definitely worth checking out though. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask. It's all on YouTube. So if wants to hear this for you, go YouTube. So. Who are some of your favorite composers or musicians, and how do you feel they influenced you as a composer? I know, I do remember reading that Gustav Holtz, I mean, not Gustav, uh, Gustav Mahler, currently your favorite composer. At the, has that changed? I love Mahler's music. I, I don't <laughs> write like Mahler. Nobody mm. does. His music is just monumental, and I just love listening to it. Um, influential to me more in terms of classical composers would be like the early, mid 20th century composers like Shostakovich, Bartok, Stravinsky, Prokofiev. Those were very influential composers to me. I love their music. To this day, I love love their music. Um, Ravel and um, the mid 20th century composers, uh, you know, Penderecki and uh, Ligeti. Not so much to listen, but just influential in terms of some of their techniques and things are amazing. Yeah. Um, and then the film composers uh, that I love, like uh, Jerry Goldsmith, John Williams, Bernard Herrmann. Um, I, like, I really enjoyed James Newton Howard's scores. And, and you know, there's, there's a number of, of fantastic uh, film composers that I think are just doing, have done amazing work. And they, and they, you know, especially Jerry Goldsmith was super influential to me when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. He was my idol, shall we say. And uh, I, I just bought every score that he produced. I actually... That's a lot of scores. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Well, I, I don't have everything, but every one that I was aware of or I could buy or whatever, and certain other ones I picked up in recent years. And I went to, I met him a few times mm-hmm. and uh, went to one of his sessions. And it was you know, great, great pleasure. His music was just brilliant. And of course, John Williams is like the most, one of the most amazing, I don't even put him in the category of just film. He's one of the greatest composers of the 20th, the early 21st century. So he's just really one of the just spectacularly amazing composers. He's, he's in the league of his own. There's, there's just something extraordinary about his output. It's, it, it's at a level that few other composers for film can achieve. It's just, it, he's just that good, you know. Do you have any other thoughts on Gustav Mahler? Because I, I I was just listening to his Titan piece just before this interview. It's beautiful. 
is really, really beautiful. It's, it's, he, he was a unique uh, composer. And, you know, there's Mahler societies. There's people who are just devoted to his music. And uh, I've read anybody who's a complete nerd like myself or Mahler would, might want to pick up the De La Grange biography, which is four volumes. It's about 4,000 pages on Mahler. <laughs> so it's an exquisitely painful detail at times. <laughs> A little more detail than you need, but it, it's he was just an extraordinary and brilliant genius, and his music is just beautiful. It's just really, it, 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 it's not for everyone. Mm. It's one of those things that you have to make an effort to listen to, and you may not like it at first, but if you make that effort and if you listen for a while, and if you're if you enter and if it speaks to you, it's like a gift. It's, like, it's an enormous gift, just like Shakespeare. You know, it's like mm. not everyone. Enjoy Shakespeare, but if you do, it's like you marvel at it every time you watch a play or you read a passage. You go, "How did he? How beautiful is this? How beautiful can humans at their greatest what height we can ascend to?" And it's and it's and it's. You know, I'm, not, I'm not thinking all those thoughts when I'm listening to his music, but I'm just like going. I'm just enchanted by its beauty and complexity and marvelous ideas and surprises and et cetera. So mm. you can't, you know, if I had to be on a desert island with just one composer's music, it would be Mahler, you mm. know, and then Beethoven, Bach follow soon after. Yeah. I mean, whenever I ask someone about Gustav Mahler, they always have a, a different interpretation of his music. So I'm always kind of surprised and kind of not by that, but um, for, for me, it's, Look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not surprised if someone who's mostly listening to pop music would not be able to appreciate it because mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's effort, you know, I mean, yeah. to get into it. But, but I just say, if, if, if you hear something that intrigues you, it, it's worth the effort because it's life. It's like, it, it takes you to a new level. So I'd like to close out this interview by asking, uh, do you have a favorite, and this is always a question I don't know whether to ask because, it kind of leaves some people at a standstill. <laughs> Do you have a favorite moment or memory that stands out to you in your career as a composer, whether it be a favorite project or an unexpected development in writing music or a fond meetup with someone influential? What's a good a good memory you have thus far in your career? Oh, I just think if there's any one moment, I've, I've, there's been, I've had a lot of satisfying moments Musically, I did. I did meet um, Vitol Ludoslavsky, who is one of the great composers of the 20th century. Also, an influence on me. His concerto for orchestra is one of the most brilliant pieces of music. Um, and so, I met him when he came to UCLA to conduct some years ago, and he gave a lecture prior to the concert, and I attended that, and it was just you know got to meet him and talk to him for 15 to 20 minutes. That was very, very moving to me. You know, I think one of the, one of the subtle but exciting things is when, when you are a composer, so one of the, there, there's like two parts, you know, there's the struggling part of composing and then there's like the like heady part of composing where you, you are struggling and struggling and all of a sudden you come up with something and you write it. And of course these days with this, with our digital audio workstations, our computer setups, we can mock up the music to make it sound pretty even if it's going to get replaced by an orchestra, it can make it sound pretty good. And when you write something and, and you really like it, you really feel strongly about it. It's like, wow, I wrote that. That's pretty cool. That's a very exciting moment. Uh, sometimes I can't even stay seated when I'm, I have to get up and walk around. And really, it's, it's, it's a very moving thing to create something new, you know, that you feel really good about. So those are those moments, and I, there's a number of them in my career that are just really, really keep you wanting to be a composer, you know? There's, there's plenty of, of pain in being a, a composer. There's a lot of competition. You, you want projects you don't get, struggle starting out, making a living even. And, but then when you do something that's meaningful, that's, that's pretty solid evidence you're doing what you should have done like you know that feels pretty good so there's a lot of little moments like that i mean i've certainly had moments of success where i've won 
awards, and that's pretty exciting, you know, to win a BAFTA, a bunch of gang awards, and get up on stage and give a speech. That's pretty, pretty heady stuff, you know. Um, hmm. Still not used to that. It's still extraordinary when colleagues or whoever say that we really like your music. That that feels pretty good, you know. So yeah, from a professional, those are sort of the areas. I, I, I don't have one one moment where I can say, you know, like I won Miss America contest and I was crying and the crown was being put on my head. You know, yeah. I don't have any one moment like that. But um, a number of interesting moments. So this was great. I, well, if, I do, if I do win Miss America, <laughs> that would be very exciting, I think, to get crowned and cry and have my makeup. I think some people might cry and protest. They're going to think it's great. <laughs> I it, think it's it, likely, but... <laughs> uh, thanks for doing this interview. Is there anything else you would like to add? Perhaps. If not, it's okay. No, that's, I think uh, you asked good questions. I appreciate it. Enjoyed chatting with you. And let me know when this is uh, going to air. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so I know, I know you're, you're, rushed, you're, <laughs> you're fixing to get to this uh, project. I can't wait to see what that is. I might be even more excited for the, to hear the music as much as I'm excited to see the game. Thank you. I, I think it should be announced uh, within the next few weeks, hopefully. Well, cool. Thanks for coming out, Gary Shiner. Sure. This was the Final Note Interviews. We'll see you next time. What you just witnessed with your ears was a Final Note interview. Questions, comments, suggestions, tips, threats? Send them my way at timelessvibes11 at gmail.com. timelessvibes11 at gmail.com.